Uh, so we'll start in prayer. Um, I have a sheet for you that has the um, propers of the day. So this white sheet of paper has all of the propers. Um, so we will uh, pray the collect for today. So that's the opening prayer that the, the priest would pray at Mass. <clears throat> it's also prayed in the office. So if you pray the divine office, the collect for the Mass of the day is prayed in at morning prayer, evening prayer, and at the liturgy of the hours, the um, divine, the um, office of readings. Um, so would you like to stand for prayer, and we can face the oratory, which is that way. <laughs> so we have the great blessing of having the blessed sacrament here at school. So we'll face towards the blessed sacrament. All right. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty, ever-living God, let us feel your compassion more readily during these days when, by your gift, we have known it more fully, so that those you have freed from the darkness of error may cling more firmly to the teachings of your truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Um, I'm, I've been teaching at St. Ambrose. This is my second tour here. So this is the second year of my second tour. So altogether, I've taught for six years at St. Ambrose, but um, I took a little gap in there to enter a cloistered monastery and then find my way back here eventually. Um, so I have... Um, spent a lot of time thinking about the liturgy. And so I'm going to share with you some of the insights of the liturgy that have come through teaching about um, the liturgy for a number of years, as well as um, living in a monastery. So in a cloister monastery, all you do is live the liturgy. That's what you do. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, this book um, that some of you have, well, all of you have a copy of it at least, and some of you have the real thing. Um, <clears throat> it's called uh, Our Way in Our Life, Christ and His Mysteries, um, and it's by Blessed Columba Marmion. So he was um, an abbot of Maritsu, uh, which was a Benedictine monastery in Belgium, and so he um, was he was a really good spiritual writer and he gave a lot of talks. So he would go around giving retreats and talks to people all over. And so a lot of people like wrote them down shorthand and then they were put into, they were made into books. So um, this book is a kind of compilation of some talks that he had given at a retreat. Um, so uh, his works are Christ's Life of the Soul, Christ and His Mysteries, Christ the Ideal of the Monk, and then there are some like compilations of his work. One of them is called Union with God, which Mother Teresa read daily. Um, John Paul II is the one who beatified Blessed Columba Marmion, um, and he beatified him in 2000, you know, during that whole year, because John Paul II saw um, Columba Marmion as having a special role in um, the liturgical movement as well as understanding divine adoption. So God has adopted us and calls us to become partakers in the divine nature. And so um, John Paul II really thought highly of Columba Marmion and, and wanted to kind of highlight him by beatifying him in the holy year of 2000. <clears throat> All right, so just kind of, we'll do a little bit of background on Columba, or on, um, Columba Marmion's basic thought, and then we'll go into the book. Um, so the goal of the spiritual life is holiness. Right. What would you say holiness is? Perfection of charity. Excellent. Sounds like you've read Lumen Gentium. What did say? He said the perfection of charity, right? So the fullness of charity, the, the love of God and the love of neighbor. Okay, so how do we get there? How do we get to that perfection of love? You gotta fast all the time, right? <laughs> no, you don't think so? You have to cut off at least two of your appendages. Not that either? How do you get to that perfection of love? Isn't it by doing crazy things? No, what is it? 
doing little things with great love, as St. Therese would say. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Columbo Marmion, he spent a lot of time in Carmelite monasteries giving talks to the sisters. So he was influenced by Therese um, as well as uh, Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. <clears throat> so that sense of doing small things with great love, that's um, in kind of his mind of what he's thinking, as well as um, the liturgy. So there's this Carmelite aspect of small things with great love, but also um, the liturgy. So he's a Benedictine monk. They spend all of their time, well, or at Labora, right, praying and working. So they pray and pray and pray the liturgy. <clears throat> and their litur the liturgy informs who they are, what they, what they focus on, what they think. And so holiness um, is participation in God's own holiness via divine adoption. Um, and that ha and I guess we'll, we'll look at what is God's holiness. So there's two different aspects of God's holiness. The first aspect of God's holiness is that it's a complete and utter separation. Welcome. Um, it's a complete and utter separation of everything that's not God. <clears throat> so uh, separation from all that's not God. Okay, so we would say definitely like an infinite distance from sin, right? So there's complete distance from sin. That which is created is not uh, God. And so in a sense, there's a complete separation from all that is created because God is, you know, not a creature. Um, <clears throat> and so... Yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll put that there. So when we think about that, um, if we want to be like God, we've got to get rid of our sin as well as get rid of our attachment to creatures, right? If we want to um, <clears throat> pursue God, there's all this aspect of like asceticism, right? So purifying yourself of your attach, of your worldly attachments, of your desire for goods and pleasure and all those things. So that's one aspect, is the separation from all that's not God. The second aspect of God's holiness is complete adherence to himself. Okay. So clinging to God. <clears throat> um. So God in the Trinity um, makes a radical gift of himself to the Son. The Son makes a radical gift of himself to the Father. So much so that these, these radical gifts, you know, are uh, fertile and create, the, not create, sorry, I'm a heretic. Um, and the Holy Spirit comes forth as uh, proceeding from this love of the Father and the Son. Um, and so we want to have this complete adherence to God. So to separate ourselves from all that's not God and then cling to God. Blessed Columbo Marmion talks a lot about um, <clears throat> being in the bosom of the Father in Sino Patris. That you would like be in the, in the Father's heart's embrace. So the son is always in the father's heart's embrace. Just like resting there. Isn't that beautiful? Being in Sino Patris. <clears throat> um, okay. So this, these two aspects that when you have the separation from all that's not God and the complete adherence to God, um, that produces um, a fecundity. And so God wants us to share in that, in his adherence to himself to the point of having spiritual fecundity that we're giving forth life. <laughs> All right, great. You approve. Fantastic. Um, okay, <clears throat> so okay, so we have um, Christ is the Son of God by nature.
Okay, so he shares in all that God has, naturally speaking. <clears throat> we, well, actually, let's think about a couple of things that the, that would entail. So if he's the son of God by nature, what does it mean to be the son? Like if you're the son of somebody, what, what do you get? Inheritance. Inheritance, yeah, good. <clears throat> what would that inheritance look like? Yeah, whatever the father has. And what does the father have? Everything. Yeah, all that is, right? So all that is, is the inheritance of the son. <clears throat> all right. So we, the, Christ has the, the inheritance. And then what else would he have? What else would it mean to be the son? Well, you can't be a son if there's not a mother. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Huh. I'm not sure how that fits. But I'm sure it does. Just need to think about that a little bit more. I was thinking father, right? So there's a relationship to the father, right? And so this is the part about being in Sinu Patris, that he is in the heart's embrace of the Father. <clears throat> okay, so Christ is that by nature. Um, so since he is the Son by nature, he's the perfect image of the, of the Father. Everything comes to him from the Father. He relates himself to the Father through love. <clears throat> All of those aspects of him we receive at our baptism. Right? So we are adopted sons of the Father. So he has this by nature, but we have it by adoption. So in baptism we are adopted. So we want to participate in God's own holiness through this divine adoption. <clears throat> now, Christ has a lot of different mysteries of his life. <clears throat> what are some of the mysteries of Christ's life? Well, having two natures in one, in one person, mm -hmm. um, that's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Having human limitations at the same time, having access to all, the, all that God has, the Father has at the same time. Yes. <laughs> that is a big mystery. How are we called to share in that mystery? Well, well through our baptism, well, well, there's in several ways, because through our baptism, of course, we say we're adopted sons of the Father. And also, through our baptism, we, uh, I mean, Christian, Christians living in this veil, veil of tears, we're called to suffer with him, too, about our sufferings and implications fashion through him. Mm-hmm. Plus, uh, since he has a human mom, we have her as our mom, too, which is pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, and the Holy Spirit comes to, to us at his, at his best, I guess you can more or less say, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have that, that as well. Plus, we're confronted with the mystery of the uh, eternal, unchanging God somehow having sense experience, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so there are these mysteries in the life of Christ that are very profound. Like, what, what does it mean to be both the Son of God and the Son of Man? What does it mean for him to um, see God face to face at the same time as having a human intellect that needs to develop? You know, there, I mean, there are, there are lots of mysteries in who Christ is that we are called the Sharon. <clears throat> so um, we're going to look at our books and kind of just read through the first chapter um, to get a sense of what Columba Marmion is saying that is possible with these mysteries of Jesus. Okay, so we are on page 
one of your book. <clears throat> and we'll um, do a little shared reading. So you can read one paragraph at a time out loud. If you'd rather not read out loud, you could just say pass. So, David, we're going to start with you. You're page one. Right there. Uh, our contact with the mysteries of Jesus. The mysteries that Jesus, the Word incarnate, lived here below were lived for us. In them, he shows himself as a model, but above all, he wills to make himself one with our souls as being the head of one mystical body whereof we are members. Such is the power of these mysteries that it is always active and effectual. From heaven, where he is seated at the right hand of God his Father, Christ continues to communicate the fruit of the different phases of his life to our souls so as to realize in them a divine resemblance to himself. Okay, so Christ is at the right hand of the Father where he was ascended, and he's distributing to us the graces of all of his mysteries bit by bit <clears throat> in order for our for us to be conformed to who he is. So as he distributes these graces to us, we become more and more like Christ. So he lived all these mysteries for us. So he went through his passion for us, like that one we've all got. But he also went through having his diaper changed for us. And he went through um, seeing his mother on the road to Calvary for us. And he went through learning how to read for us. All of the things that he did, he did for us, and we get to participate in each of those mysteries kind of bit by bit. That's what the liturgical year is about. All right, next paragraph. Participation in the mysteries of Jesus requires the cooperation of the soul. If God reveals the secrets of his love towards us, it is in order that we may accept them, that we may enter into his views and designs and adapt ourselves to the eternal plan apart from which neither holiness nor salvation is possible. If Christ opens to us the unfathomable treasures of his states and mysteries, it is that we may draw upon them and make them our own. Okay, so we have to cooperate in this, not by crazy acts of penance, but by kind of opening ourselves up to the mysteries as they unfold in the, the liturgical year. But we do not seek for that which we, which we know not. The will does not attach itself to a good that the intellect does not set before it. Ignoti nulo cupido. Now that Christ has taken his sensible presence from us, how are we to know his mysteries, their beauty, harmony, virtue and power. Above all, what are we to do in order to put to be put into life-giving contact with them? Okay, so that's a good question. Christ has ascended on high. How are we going to know who he is? Scripture. Okay, you got it. Did you read ahead? Okay, good. So scripture would be one way. Can you think of another way? Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit? Okay, good. Another way? In the sacraments. Good. Oh, man. You guys, you're awesome. All right, keep going. The knowledge of Jesus and of the various stages of his life is to be gained, first of all, from the Gospels. It is enough for us to read these sacred pages, so simple and so sublime, that it is to say, if we read them with faith, in order to see and hear Christ himself. For this book is inspired. Light and power go out from it, to enlighten and strengthen souls that are upright and sincere. Happy are they who open it every day. They drink at the very well spring of living waters. Another way of coming to the knowledge of Jesus and of his mysteries is by associating ourselves with the church in her liturgy. Before ascending into heaven, Christ said to the apostles upon whom he founded his church, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. As the Father hath sent me, I also send you. He that heareth you, heareth me. This is why the church is like an extension throughout the ages of the incarnation. She replaces Jesus with us. She has inherited the divine tenderness of her heavenly bridegroom. 
From him she has received as dowry, with the power of sanctifying souls, the riches of grace acquired by Jesus upon the cross on, their, on the day of their mystical espousals. So the church is an extension of the incarnation. Isn't that cool? Have you ever thought about the church that way? The church is an extension of the incarnation, that Christ was incarnated, God became flesh and dwelt among us, and that's what the church is. The church extends out God dwelling among us. <clears throat> and so the church has received as a dowry this power of passing on the grace that Christ won. All proportion guarded, we can then say of the church what her bridegroom said of himself. She is for us the way, the truth, and the life. She is the way because we only come to God through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus. And we can only be united to Christ by being incorporated, in fact, or in desire, in the church through baptism. She is the truth, because with all the authority of her founder, she has the custody of the truth brought to us by revelation, which she proposes to our acceptance and belief. Finally, she is the life, because by the public worship, which she alone has the right of organizing, by the sacraments which she alone administers, she distributes the life of grace to souls and maintains it within them. We know that it is especially by the liturgy that the church brings up the souls of her children, that she may perfect them in the image of Christ, which is the very form of our predestination. So it's the, in the liturgy that this happens, <clears throat> that you are transformed into Christ, right? You become the image of Christ through the liturgy. Mr. Cease. Guided by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus himself, the church each year unfolds be before the eyes of her children the complete cycle of Christ's mysteries, sometimes greatly abridged, sometimes in their exact chronological order, as during Holy Week and Paschal time. She thus causes each mystery of her divine bridegroom to be vividly represented and lived over again. She makes us pass through each stage of his life. If we allow ourselves to be guided by her, we shall infallibly come to know the mysteries of Jesus, and above all, we shall enter into the thoughts and feelings of his divine heart. Okay. So in the liturgy, we enter into the thoughts and feelings of Christ's heart. So you take on Christ and your thoughts become his thoughts and your feelings even become his. Have you ever experienced that? Okay, so let's look for a minute <clears throat> at um, this the set of the propers for today. And what I want you to do is talk to the person next to you. We'll read through them and then talk to the person next to you and figure out what does it seem like the church is saying is the thoughts and feelings of Christ today? What is Christ thinking and feeling today in the liturgy? Okay, so you can read it and then talk to the person next to you. Go ahead. All right, coming back together. Anything that you want to share as an insight of what Christ was doing or thinking about today? Some transformation. We have error to truth. We have dying and rising, and we have old to new. Neat. So Christ calling us um, out of error, death, and oldness truth and rising and newness. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you went to Mass today or you prayed the liturgy of the hours or something, that's what happened to you today, is that you went from death to new life, from oldness to newness, right? That Christ communicated that to you in the liturgy of today. And not just to you, but to your family and to the world, right? So the more that each 
person in the church takes into themselves the, the newness of Christ, the more that that passes into the world. Um, anything else that you noticed? Well, the triumph passes into compassion. So you have the joy and pettiness, I guess, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the victory. And yeah. Then going, then going into compassion. Yeah, neat. To be sure. Yeah, so every day of the octave of Easter, we would sing this antiphon. Let us sing to the Lord for his gloriously triumphant horse and chariot is cast into the sea. And it just was so great, you know, Christ triumphed over death. And that's a triumph for us as well, right? That we are triumphing over sin and death. That we are coming to this new life as well. That um, he's cast horse and rider into the sea. That, you know, all of the wickedness of the world is cast into the sea and people are coming up new life with the new life of baptism. Um, yeah, so there's this sense of triumph, but then let us feel your compassion. <laughs> okay. We don't need just you triumphing over sin, we, but we need to feel that heart's embrace of the Father. We need to be present in the heart's embrace of the Father. Yeah, when, when the word compassion is used in the Gospels, it's like the... Uh, your innards are stirred, you know, like your uh, bowels, not bowels, <laughs> yeah, like that sort of sense, like the inmost parts of you are all are disturbed. And so Christ allows his, his uh, innards to be disturbed and to, to pour out his compassion upon us. Great. Yeah, so that's another thing that, could, that comes to us through the liturgy of today. What else did you notice? Yeah. There's a resolve. Yeah, that we may cling more firmly to the teachings of your truth. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? So you could just spend your holy hour every morning just meditating on the um, collect of the day and letting that inform your life. I really encourage you to pay attention to the collect of the day, that that's a way that Christ is trying to transform you each day. So... Um, when we think about holiness, it's passive transformation rather than like an active, I'm going to do this on my own. It's not that I need to, um, you know, overcome all of the things that are wrong in me, but that Christ will glor gloriously triumph through my participation in the liturgy, that he does the work. All I need to do is be open to him and he transforms me interiorly. Um, great. All right, so let's look at some other colics to see what we got. Um, okay, so um, actually, no, sorry. Before I did that, I wanted to just do um, Advent. Okay, so the very first Sunday of Advent, the entrance antiphon um, is just so beautiful. Um, so it says, To you, O Lord, I, to you I lift up my soul, O my God. In you I have trusted, let me not be put to shame. Nor let my enemies exalt over me, and let none who hope in you be put to shame. So this is the first thing that you hear the first Sunday of the church year. Like this entrance antiphon, this introit, gives you the key to the entire liturgical year. To you I lift up my soul, O oh my God. Ate lavave. So... Christ is praying that, right? To you I lift up my soul, O God, and you I have trusted. Let me not be put to shame. So Christ prays that to the Father. But who else prays that prayer? Mary. Mary. To you I lift up my soul, O my God, and you I have trusted. Let me not be put to shame. Right? Our Lady. I mean, can't you just see her praying that as, as the angel comes? as she gets pregnant, as she starts traveling to Elizabeth, like, oh, to you, I've lifted up my soul, my God, I've trusted you, there's these guys over there, like, I gotta keep going, but Our Lady is praying that as she goes, right, down to see Elizabeth. Let me not be put to shame. I don't really want to be stoned to death, but, you know, if that's what you want, Lord. Um, yeah, so Our Lady prays this. Who else prays this? Esther. 
Yeah, so before she goes in to the king, mm -hmm. right? She prays a prayer of that kind. Who else? David. David. Yeah, this is from a psalm, so we assume that David probably prayed it, right? To you will lift up my soul. And you I have trusted, let me not be put, let not my enemies exalt over me, right? David's on the run from all his enemies, but uh, he's praying, like, let, my not, let not my enemies exalt over me. Who else prays this prayer? Jesus prays this prayer, right? Yeah. So he has uh, the human intellect and will, so he lifts those up to God. Right? And you can imagine him praying this like at different points throughout his life. Right? When Maybe when some of the <clears throat> scribes and Pharisees come up and they want to trick him again, you know. Maybe then Jesus prays to you, Lord, I lift up my soul. Let me not be put to shame. Or maybe there are some kids in his neighborhood who are really jerks to him and they just, mm -hmm. you know. To you, oh God, I lift up my soul. Let me not be put to shame. Would you say that any of you pray this prayer? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so the church, right, the church puts this on our lips, or the cantor's lips, at the very beginning of Advent to say, like, this is the way that we're going to focus the liturgical year. To you I lift up my soul, God. So it's the soul of Christ, but it's the soul of the bride, his church. It's the soul of Mary. It's the soul of Joseph, you know, like, that this is on the, the, the lips of all um, all of God's people. And so we can enter into the prayer of Christ. Like we enter into the Trinitarian dialogue through the words of the liturgy. So if you want to know what the Father's saying to the Son, you go to the Mass at midnight because <laughs> there's only a couple times in the church year when the Father is speaking. Um, but if you want to hear what the Father's saying to the Son or what the Son is saying to the Father, you go to Mass, and you hear what they're praying. We're entering into the Trinitarian dialogue through the propers of the Mass. Isn't that beautiful? Um, all right, so let's go through some colics. Do, do you want to do Easter, Ordinary Time, Advent? What would you like? Easter. Easter. Okay, that's where we are. All right, Easter Sunday. Can you see? Do I need to make it bigger? It's good. Okay, thank you. All right, so Easter Sunday. O oh God, who on this day through your only begotten Son have conquered death and unlocked for us the path to eternity, grant, we pray, that we who keep the solemnity of the Lord's resurrection may, through the renewal brought by your Spirit, rise up in the light of life. Anything stick out to you? Unlocked for us the path to eternity. Because all those who have gone before did not have access to the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so you're picturing that like Anastasis icon where you've got Christ, you know, like pulling Adam and Eve out of the tomb and bringing them up to heaven, sort of. Whew! Pretty exciting stuff. We got access now. So we don't have access. I mean, we got access to the path to eternity, but we also have access to the Father's heart. Like we know the heart of the Father. We can enter into the heart of the Father. And he's hidden in the sacred heart of Jesus. Well, that's a beautiful way to think about it. Yeah. That's why we have to go to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, because that's where the Father is. Yeah. All right, should we look at another collect? All right. Second Sunday of Easter. God of everlasting mercy, who in the very recurrence of the Paschal Feast 
Kindle the faith of the people you have made your own. Increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font they have been washed, by whose spirit they have been reborn, by whose blood they have been redeemed. Anything stick out to you? Yeah, and this is the second Sunday of Easter, so there's just all of that light that's been spread at the Easter Vigil. And then, you know, like that light is spreading out even more, kindling the faith. Yeah. The spirit of sharing. Hmm. Tell me more. What? Tell me more. Um, and we're, we're praying that it increases and it goes out to places it hasn't been before, so people mm-hmm. have Yeah. Not, not ours, but something to be shared. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like the grant that all may grasp and rightly understand. Because sometimes you, you just read over something in passing, Jesus died to save us, when you actually stop to think about what all that means, that they may understand what font they've been washed by, whose blood they have been redeemed. This I was thinking about what we experience on Holy Saturday, the Easter Vigil, and all of those things are part of that. And now it's like, no, we need to know, and we need to increase, and that we need to understand what we were talking about. That mm-hmm. Yeah. So we are. Oh, it's a little digression, but. You know, there, there are kind of two different cycles of the church year. You've got preparation, celebration, and then the ordinary time. But if we think about, like, Advent, Christmas, the time, the Advent, or the ordinary time afterwards, that's time to kind of, like, grow. Green grows, you know, mm-hmm. to grow from the mystery. So all the time after Easter, after Pentecost, that's all like green growing time for the mysteries that you've celebrated. So the church, you know, you've got this intense moment of celebrating the Easter mystery, but then you're supposed to keep like thinking about it all the way through. You don't just let it go. You, you want to be able to grasp that, you know, like to adhere to it, to take it in. Yeah. I mean, we would die of love if we knew by whose spirit we have been reborn, by whose blood we have been redeemed. Should we do another one? How about the one for next week? So we're in the third week of Sunday of Easter right now, but we could look at the fourth Sunday of Easter because that's the one for next Sunday. Almighty ever-living God, Lead us to a share in the joys of heaven so that the humble flock may reach where the brave shepherd has gone before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the the sheep follow where the shepherd leads because they know his voice and they follow him. And he does lead through the cross to the resurrection. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's interesting you hear that. Mm-hmm. I just think about the joys of heaven. <laughs> I want to share in the joys of heaven. Yeah. Well, he thinks we have to go through <laughs> Saint, is it Saint Catherine? Like I, I am 
God who is and you are she who is not or something. Mm. Hmm. You know. Sienna. Okay, Killer Sienna. Yeah, yes. I don't know. Like, so he's the brave shepherd who is. <laughs> we are the humble flock who is not. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but more and more we want Christ's life to be in us. So I must decrease so that he can increase. But then, I mean, you get back yourself. Like, I don't know. In, in a way, you're everything and nothing. That, that Christ, I mean, he fills us up. So that our wills are united with him, with his will. Our thoughts are united with his thoughts. Um, and it's a letting go, but it's also like a gaining. You know, it's, it's the gain of, of the God man. You're letting go of your will so that you can have his will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so beautiful. Yes. Which they are. You do know that. Isn't that beautiful how the liturgy puts it all together for you? So the response to the song is we are the people, his people, the sheep of his flock. The second reading is from Revelation talking about the lamb. And the gospel, of course, is what you said to the sheep. Isn't that great? So you, I mean, if you pay attention to the colic, then you'll see it illuminating everything else. And then you'll have this secret into the mystery. So um, Dom, Dom Columbia Marmion says that um, the colic gives you the secret of the Mass or the inmost grace. So the secret of the Mass or the inmost grace, the way that you know what God is trying to communicate to you, the inmost grace. And so paying attention to the colic is this, it's just a, it's a life-changing sort of um, thing. So that's what I hope came to you from this talk, is that now you're going to pay attention to the collect, mm -hmm. and that's going to transform your life. And are they always the same then? So like the same liturgical year, are they same? Don't, isn't there three cycles? A, there B, are, C? yep, for the readings, but the, the readings. collect is the same. So okay, the collect so every, doesn't... Every February 20th. Same Every third Sunday in ordinary time oh, okay. is the same collect. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, <clears throat> the yeah the the collects for ordinary time. Um, well, it starts actually the second Sunday in ordinary time, but those would, I mean, those kind of change. Right. Okay. Right. So depending on the movable feasts. So depending when Easter is every year, like when when the Sundays are kind of changes around, but um, yes, but more, but they don't change with the, with the, um, with the three year cycle. So this, um, this one, the 20th Sunday in ordinary time, this is one of my favorite colleagues. I'm always so excited when it comes around. Um, yeah, that one. Oh God, who have prepared for those who love you good things, which no eye can see. Fill our hearts, we pray, with the warmth of your love. Oh, no, that's not what the one I was looking for. Sorry. That was a good one. This one's better. <laughs> um, Almighty, ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the merits and desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask. That is a collect. Oh, man. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? To pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask. Yeah. So you're saying that 
secret of the mass and inmost what? Grace, inmost grace. Yeah, it gives you the secret to what Christ is thinking and desiring for you at that mass. Yeah. So the college has been saying throughout all three years. Yeah. It, it pulls in different aspects of the readings from each year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is really fun. <laughs> so sometimes it's a bit of a leap, but it can, I mean, if you try to do it, then it just illuminates. So the sisters in the monasteries would have the, these like liturgical garden days. So you would talk about the collect or the reading or the, uh, the introit and you would just say it, like how beautiful it was and what it made you think of and all these things. So they would just spend their whole Sunday recreation time talking about the liturgy. <laughs> it's just really cute and ridiculous. Does yes. every collect then contain the twofold aspect? That's a good question. I don't know. Because that one obviously does. Yeah, it does. Pardon what conscience dreads. I mean, that says just go to confession and just say it. Yeah. And to give what prayer does not do to ask. That's like bringing us to the Father. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't that be an interesting study? You could go through all of them and see if the two aspects are in all of them. That's your homework. Yeah, I wonder. I don't know. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Well, you talked about this being kind of a passive transformation. Yeah. Kind of the same time the cross stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, in some ways, but he's also like a lot of uh, ascent of Mount Carmel. <laughs> yeah. You know? So the ascent of Mount John of the Cross was a, a, an incredible ascetic. You know, he didn't. He barely wore shoes. He slept outside. He never ate really. He, he ascetic. What do you mean? I don't know that word. Um, so, The yeah, kind of like how can you let go of everything materially? Yeah, you have to be a very small footprint. Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, a small carbon footprint. There you okay. go. There you go. You're taking very yeah. little of anything. Okay. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. You bring the carbon footprint in because we're called to asceticism in the material world, but it's not for salvation or to bring us closer to God, it's to save Gaia. Oh yeah, so it's really a, a, a warpedness. So I, yeah. I, so I just wanted to. What is a skirt? This is a footprint. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, yeah. 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 But what was your original question? Was okay. So it, it's a so, like some days you might bring this much attention and presence to the liturgy, and sometimes you might bring this much, like mm -hmm. just a type. Mm -hmm. So. We might say that God is not limited by what we bring him mm -hmm. as long as we bring him something. Mm -hmm. So even if you're like distracted and you have a kid and whatever, like you're still, whatever part of that liturgy you can connect with or hold on to, even if you're not even like processing all this. Yeah. Or is that Yeah, the to best through? image that I have of motherhood in the liturgy is my sister double breastfeeding her <laughs> children during the... Um, during the uh, consecration, and the priest is saying, no, this is my body, and then this is my blood, and my sister's like pouring herself out, literally, for her children. Uh, she was in the back cry room, you know, so, right, right, right. but, I mean, what more could a mother do? So, my sister obviously is not aware of the fact that, you know, like, how is she going to be, but she is a living image of what is happening in the mass. Even if she's intellectually connecting that at that moment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How could she? Yeah. 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 But Christ, I mean, Christ is greater than our emotion, like our intellectual yeah. or emotional yeah. states. Yeah. So, yes. I mean, I think sometimes, um, I don't know, kids have a way of like, um, being just terribly distracting for a while 
And then all of a sudden they'll like look and be so attentive at this one moment of the mass and it makes you pay attention in a way you've never paid attention before. Um, so there's that, but there's, I don't know. Yeah, so, you do, <clears throat> I mean, even if you're one of these Benedictine monks, that doesn't mean that you're gonna be paying attention all the time, right, right. you know? And that the transformation happens, <clears throat> yeah. Whether you gave him this much or this much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we focus so much on youth, but we also, because, you know, Christ died when he was in his mid-30s, he was vibrant and all that, but, you know, we also see our, our Catholic family members decline also, mm -hmm. and the, the loss of ability to fully be present. If you've ever gone to a Christmas Mass at All Saints Assisted Living before mm -hmm. taking your mom home for dinner, or any of those liturgies, you see the the years of of following the shepherd, and they just know his call. Mm -hmm. They don't quite know anything else but to follow the shepherd, and it's very beautiful mm -hmm. in that way too. Yeah, there was a really elderly sister at the um, monastery who uh, she she had an electric wheelchair. <laughs> she like zoom around the monastery in a little electric wheelchair <laughs> and bump into stuff, you know. But she was just super holy. Anyways, one time she was going past, like we had a long area um, that led to the Blessed Sacrament and she was kind of driving past that area and she stopped, blew a kiss and then kept going. But I was like right here intercepting it. <laughs> and so then later that day she like pulled me over and she's like, you know, I, that kiss was not for you. <laughs> okay, thanks, sister. Um, you know, so that love for the Lord is present, you know. Yeah. Good. Other things? Well, we start off with talking about God, holiness, because it can complete separation from the things that are, that are creatures. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's something we can't do because we are creatures. Yep. Uh, but uh, I think for those, so, Separation, it's not separation it's as, as it is, as he went and said, detachment, mm -hmm. which is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Because you can't be literally separate from the creatures because we're no. part of our whole No, 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 but I mean, that's the mystery of the incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. Is that Christ takes on the human nature. Now, the human nature is joined to the divinity forever. Forever, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a great mystery. Yeah, right. Anything else? I'm looking up the penalty and it's good. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, depends what you're looking up. <laughs> what? What's yeah, what's your source? <laughs> so this is me. I love the root words. Mm -hmm. So we're reading down the page from the fertile, fruitful, fertile, productive, rich, abundant, and then to suck suckle palare to suck femina woman literally she who suckles so this mm -hmm. sounds like holy mother church doesn't it mm -hmm. and this sounds like what you said about the incarnation doesn't it mm -hmm. so there we are yes yeah i mean we're all called to be spiritually Sucking fruitful the holy mother's food yes yeah, so, so the, the food of the liturgy is, I mean, the Eucharist, but also the prayers. That the more that you, um, you know, chew the cud or suck mm -hmm. the breast of Holy Mother Church, the more that you get the spiritual fruits. And that's what Father said, EWTN homily today, Father Leonard. Mm -hmm. He said about feasting and food, and this is the scriptures, it's food, it's feasting, it's, it's the Mass. Is our food, our feast, we should be there. Yeah. Yep. Doesn't fecundity also, though, in, imply a transference of life, a, a giving, not necessarily um, food, but just life itself and, and a little bit of inheritance, too, because you don't have fecundity of, amongst unrelated things. It's not like you can 
get some liturgical similac off the grocery shelf and just take it somewhere. It's it's a, a related life giving, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is produce and yield are in this too. Mm -hmm. The first time I went across that word it was when I was reading Humanity. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I guess just as a closing, we can read this little sheet. You could put this up on your mirror and read it every day or memorize it like one of my classes is doing. So Christ enables, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church 521, Christ enables us to live in him all that he himself lived and he lives it in us. By his incarnation, he, the Son of God, has in a certain way united himself with each man. We are called only to become one with him, for he enables us, as the members of his body, to share in what he lived for us in his flesh as our model. We must continue to accomplish in ourselves the stages of Jesus' life and his mysteries, and often to beg him to perfect and realize them in us and in his whole church. For it is the plan of the Son of God to make us and the whole church partake in his mysteries and extend them to and continue them in us and in his whole church. This is his plan for fulfilling his mysteries in us. And that's why we can't close the churches at the door. There's our food. Yeah. Yep. If we need it. Do they say churches of our door? Does it say door of our churches? Yeah, the doors of our churches. I agree. Amen, sister. All right, great. Well, thank you. Enjoy your evening. The Lord is over there if you want to go talk to him in the oratory.